anyone here who needs a blessing will receive a blessing. And Lord, anybody listening online, it will be the same. Lord, that you would bless many hearts and many heads. And Lord, that this little stream that's offered tonight, Lord, would grow and become greater. And Heavenly Father, many would be washed and many minds, Lord, would be refocused. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, with the text we just read tonight, may be very familiar to most of you. We read from Hebrews chapter 1, and we read through the whole chapter into chapter 2, and I finished specifically on a very important text of Scripture, and one that really applies to us in our day. I finished in chapter 2, and I finished with this line, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You know, when you read that chapter of Hebrews, the first chapter of Hebrews, what it tells us is that God has given us the ultimate when he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. It says in the opening text that he spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. It says that he spoke in divers ways. He spoke through prophets and God also spoke through angels as his messengers. But in these last days, in our day, for the last 2,000 years, we have been entrusted with the greatest revelation that God has ever sent to planet Earth. He didn't send the message by a prophet. He didn't send the message by an angel. He sent the message by his own son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son not just to bring a message, but to be a message. Christ, the incarnate Son of God, and God the Son, who dwelled in human flesh, who John said they handled, they touched him, they heard him, they interacted with him. He said the word of life. John was blown away by the living word of God, Jesus Christ. John was totally blown away by this man in whom even Pilate could say, I find no fault in this man. The Lord Jesus Christ is the supreme revelation of God to planet Earth. God had sent many messages and many messengers in time past, but the whole gist of chapter 1 in Hebrews is that God has sent us as superior to any prophet that ever went before, good as they were. God has sent as superior even to angels, as good as they were. And so we come down to the bit of scripture that we read, and we who have received the word of God, to the people of God in every generation who have received the message of the gospel, the warning goes out, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape? What is there to escape? We escape from the punishments of God on those who depart and who disobey the message of God. God sent angels in time past. Many times in the Old Testament, angels brought a message to the people of God. And the people of God were responsible to take the message as from the Lord and either to obey or to disobey. Think about Lot and his wife. Think about how God got the message through to Lot that judgment was on the way. And how did Lot escape? Lot escaped because he obeyed the voice of the angel. The angel brought the message, the man obeyed, but someone didn't obey. Do you know who it was? The angel said to Lot's wife, he told them all, don't look behind you. But what happened to Lot's wife is that she disobeyed the message from God and she received punishment. It says every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. God punished those who did not obey his messengers. That's not a message we like to hear today in this generation, that God would judge people, that he would punish people who disobeyed, who neglected his word. The Bible tells us clearly that many times as God sent his message and as people heard, they were blessed as they obeyed and as they disobeyed, they came under judgment and divine discipline. Think of even a more recent one than Lot. I'm thinking about John the Baptist's father, Zacharias. Do you remember he went into the temple to offer up incense? It was his turn in the temple. And do you remember how Gabriel came and stood before him? And Gabriel delivered a message from heaven, such an exciting message. 
such a powerful message from God. And what did Zacharias do? He didn't believe. Unbelief. And what did the angel do? The angel struck him dumb. He was punished. Why? Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. If God sent angels as messengers and men did not obey the message brought by an angel, then the gist of this passage in Hebrews up until now is saying to us and to all of God's people who have ever heard the message of the gospel, how shall we escape? How shall we as a nation, as a church, how shall we escape the justice and the judgments and the divine retribution of God? Whenever God has put out all the stops and whenever God has sent not a messenger but his son to become a message. When God sent the spotless Christ into this world to die a gruesome and a bloody death and to take the wrath of God for sinners upon him. To rise again on the third day. To ascend into heaven. How much more is God not going to hold people accountable. For what they do with this message. That has come from heaven in the form of the Son. That's the gist of the text. How shall we escape when God has sent his ultimate message. Would it be fair to say tonight. That the nations of the west. Who have had the light of the glorious gospel. For many years, who have had the book in our classrooms, in our courtrooms, in our council chambers, would it be fair to say tonight that there's a fair degree of neglect for the Word of God? At a national and a governmental level, I can see that's true. I preach on the streets of Northern Ireland and I see PSNI officers now standing nearly against an opposition to the Word of God. I watched on television as the Conservative government put their hands, 80% of them, on a Bible to swear into office, and yet they push the call, the call and the commands of God aside. Can you see where we've come to as a nation? The neglect of the Word of God. But, friends, even worse than the nation, what about as a church? Where have we come to as a church? Where have we come to as the people of God in the island of Ireland? An island that once was called the land of saints and scholars. It came out of pagan darkness. Absolute total darkness. A man called St. Patrick and many like him brought the message of the gospel to the shores of Ireland. And this island was lit up for hundreds of years with the message of transformation, hope and blessing that God had sent from heaven. Where are we today? the gospel light in Ireland? Have we neglected the gospel? Have we turned away from what we're meant to be doing? I think it's very easy for us all to nod our head and it's very easy in our hearts to say yes I think there has been a general neglect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's no longer the radiant glorious gospel because our image and our view of Christ is so low. The gospel has lost its appeal, not only to the world, but unfortunately to the church, because the gospel has no longer become the focus. The church is no longer all about winning souls and spreading the gospel. Now, I know I'm not speaking to everyone, but I'm saying as a whole, because we're all part of the whole, we're all part of the big lump, and if you take the big lump generally, 80 to 90, maybe 95 percent of the church is not doing what God wants them to do. They're neglecting the message of the gospel. They've lost the message of the gospel. Repentance toward God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, these foundations, go into all the world and preach the gospel. For the most part, that has been set aside and lesser things have come in and taken priority. But I believe God would show us a way back. I believe tonight God has not left us helpless and hopeless Although we're in a grim and a desperate situation, I believe the Word of God gives us a way out. It gives us an exit plan. It gives us a strategy to get out of where we are and get back to be where God wants us to be. To be the church of God and to be the church of Christ. Once again, valuing Christ, 
valuing the message of the gospel above all other messages, holding him as the head and not the tail, getting back to our priorities and getting things right. I want you to turn with me in your Bible back into the Old Testament to the book of Jonah, because I believe in the book of Jonah there's a type, there's a pattern, there's an education if we want to learn the way back and we want to understand what's going on in our day. Jonah chapter 2, there's a few verses that I want to read from it, but I'm sure you all know the story of Jonah. I'm not going to read the whole story, it's a well-known story, but essentially Jonah was commissioned by God. He was called by God, he was commissioned by God, and he was sent out by God to go on a mission and to preach to Nineveh. Now tonight I want to suggest to you that Jonah is a type of the church of Jesus Christ and Nineveh is a type of the world in whatever form we encounter it. Jonah was told to go and to preach to the people at Nineveh. But what did Jonah do? He did what most of us do on many occasions when the Lord wants us to go that way, we go that way. And we do our own thing, and usually to our own hurt and to our own destruction. But thank God he's merciful. And when we fall on our face, he gets us up again and we can begin to move. So in this story and in this word about Jonah, I believe that there's a significant message for the church of Jesus Christ. You see, what happened to Jonah is that Jonah disobeyed God. He turned away from God. And then he came under divine discipline from God. You see, what happened to Jonah, as you'll know if you read chapter 1 down into 2, Jonah went down. Jonah went down. And so the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ in our day, it's also following the same trajectory, following the same flight path, and it's not going up. Unfortunately, the general trend has been down. We're regenerated, but we're degenerated yeah. at the same time, you know, and that shouldn't really be. But this happened to, to, to Jonah. We're not the first people in the Bible this has happened to. God took Jonah off the platform. You know, Jonah was called, he was given a message, he didn't do it, he ended up getting thrown into the sea, and he went down in the belly of a whale. God took him off the scene. He became irrelevant. He had no voice. Where was he? Cooked up in the belly of a whale. Imagine. Maybe half a mile down in a sea. That's a thousand miles long and five hundred wide. Jonah was taken off the sea. And he went down. I wonder is Jonah's experience. Our experience. I wonder could we say what's happened to Jonah. Has been happening to the church of Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 2. There's just three things I want to put out here and leave with you as far as the experience of Jonah goes to see if that lines up with what you're experiencing in the church of Jesus Christ. It says in chapter 2 in verse 5, B, the last part, Jonah said of his experience, the weeds were wrapped around my head. The weeds were wrapped around my head. Can you picture Jonah in the belly of the whale? All kinds of seafood and seaweed and garbage and slime and junk. And this man, he's just buried in it. It's all tangled up and it keeps coming and it keeps coming. And he's constantly trying to throw his way and keep his head clear. Does that not speak to of us of our day where we are in the church of Jesus Christ? Where many heads are tangled up in a multitude of doctrines. Overemphasis on this doctrine, overemphasis on that doctrine. You have all kinds of Bible verse doctrines, you have all kinds of doctrines on the end times, all kinds of teachings Calvinism, Arminianism, King James, New King James, No King James, Premillennial, Postmillennial, Amillennial. You know the list, it goes on and on and on. Are we not all tangled up in our head? Have we not come to a place where our heads are full and our hearts are empty? And we're confused and frustrated and there's divisions and there's disputes. Has that been your experience? 
It was Jonah's experience when he went down that his head got in a mess. That was Jonah's experience. I think that's the experience of many today in the church of Jesus Christ. Look at the next part in verse 6. What else did he experience? Jonah said, I went down to the bottom of the mountains. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. Can I suggest to you that we're at a time whenever we have hit rock bottom? Jonah hit rock bottom. Jonah went not just under the surface. Jonah went to the very bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. He couldn't get any lower if he tried. He hit rock bottom. He was at a low point. And could we say tonight that for mostly our services, mostly in our churches, we're at a low point. We have hit rock bottom in our churches for the most part. I don't speak for all, but for the most part, our services are cold, our hearts are hard, and we're at a low point. We're like Jonah when he was in the belly of the whale. He could not get any lower. Look at the other part in verse 6. It says, The earth with her bars was about me forever. Think of Jonah. He's in the belly of a whale. He has no liberty. He has no freedom. He is caged in by what? He is caged in by flesh. I wonder is God trying to speak to us something in our day? Do you know that a whale has huge, massive walls of blubber and flesh? I wonder today in the church of Jesus Christ, are there many spiritual people and they're crying out like they're in the belly of the whale because they're caged in by the flesh. We're closed in by the flesh, by the motives and by the agendas of men who want big numbers, more popularity, more money, better preachers. Are we not caged in, by the most part, by the flesh? In leadership, in the presbytery, wherever you want to take it, we're surrounded, surrounded. There's a spiritual remnant, but they're surrounded by the flesh. And how are we ever going to escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Praise God for hope. You know, Jonah didn't finish his days in the belly of a whale. He didn't become fish food. God had a plan for Jonah. And thank God, God has a plan for the church of Jesus Christ. We've looked at the problems. But friends, what about looking at the solution? Looking at Jonah's experience helps us to see, yes, that's where we are. But thank God we can also look to Jonah and we can find that there's a way out. But first, friends, we have to recognize where we are. We have to recognize that we're in the same place as Jonah was in. Where was Jonah? Down in the Mediterranean Sea. Far from any help from man. Far from a fishing hook. Far from a fishing boat or a fishing net. In his day, there's no sonar. There's no radar. There's no submersibles. There's no hope for Jonah unless God intervenes. Jonah is beyond man's intervention. But praise God, like the church of our day, he's not beyond God's intervention. Because God can speak to the fish. And God can bring Jonah out of the belly of a wheel and back onto his feet again on dry land. How did Jonah get the help of God? How did Jonah get out of the belly of the wheel? Friends, look at chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Then Jonah prayed. Hallelujah. Jonah prayed. And who did Jonah pray to? It says that Jonah prayed unto the Lord. And he prayed out of the fish's belly unto the God who made the fish, who made the sea, who made Jonah. And he prayed unto God and thanked God his prayer was heard. And up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. Hallelujah. Isn't there a picture of Christ in Jonah? You see, Jonah cried out. He didn't just pray, friends. I submit to you that he had desperate prayer. He says, out of the belly of hell, cried I. Oh yes, we need to get desperate prayer. You see, Jonah prayed out of desperation. He prayed out of a desperate situation. 
He prayed out of desperation, but friends, he prayed in hope. You see, he prayed out of desperation, but he prayed in hope. Look at verse 4. He says, Yet will I look again to thy holy temple. Look at verse 6. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption. Look at verse 9. He says, Salvation is of the Lord. You see, Jonah prayed in hope to the God of heaven because he knew the power and he knew the authority and he knew the ways of God. He knew that Nineveh could be saved. And if he knew Nineveh could be saved, even though he didn't want them to be saved, he knew God could save Jonah in his predicament. And friends, today we've got to understand and know that God we're dealing with is the God of Jonah. The God who can lift the church of Jesus out of the belly of the whale and get us back on the shore. But friends, if we hit the shore, we've got to be like Jonah. He said, I will pay my vow unto the Lord. And friends, we are about men and women of God to evangelize this world with this great gospel of Jesus Christ. How shall we escape if we neglect the gospel? Friends, we escape this way. We recognize our neglect. We recognize our need. And we call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, hallelujah, shall be saved. Isn't it wonderful tonight, friends, to know that the church of Jesus Christ is not finished, it's not over, it's not done, but we have got to realize where we are. We've got to realize where God is. The church must realize Christ's orders are evangelized. That's the orders of the captain. That's the order of the day. God hasn't moved. We have moved. And if we want to get back to God, if we want out of the belly of the wheel, if we want to go again for God, we've got to begin to pray. But we've got to pray with understanding that when God revives us, we're going to go. And we're going to go to Nineveh with the gospel. Not any gospel, but the old-fashioned gospel. Hallelujah. The gospel of repentance toward God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message. And that's what God wants us to be okay with once again. God told him in chapter 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And it came the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. You know today, friends, the government is looking for help from the banks. They're looking for help from vaccines. They're looking all around the place for help. But the help for this nation, the help for this country, it has to come from God. This country needs God. This country needs the church of Jesus Christ alive and well on their feet, praying in the Holy Ghost, preaching the Word of God, seeing hearts changed, homes changed, communities leveled by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nineveh was changed in a day when a preacher of righteousness came with the message of the King. We have the message sent from heaven with the royal seal of approval in the Holy Ghost. We can preach the word of God and Belfast can be changed. Northern Ireland can be changed. North, South, East and West on the island of Ireland can be converted. Hallelujah. It's been done before and we can do it again. But friends, we've got to get back to the good old fashioned gospel. We've got to know that God has called us to go. To go. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to get up and to go with the gospel, to value his son, to value the souls of those who are outside of Christ. To do it, friends, we just need to take those three verbs and get on the curves. Three verbs to remember to get on the curves. Arise, go, and preach. You see, no, it, Jonah was vomited up on the beach. And no doubt Jonah lay there for a while on the beach wondering what on earth had just happened to him. I wouldn't like to be in him journeying up through all that sludge and out the mouth of the whale onto the beach, would you? But there he was, lying on the beach, and the word of God comes to Jonah. I don't think Jonah waited, or God wasted any time in speaking to Jonah. And God told him to arise. And that's what we need to do, friends. We need to arise. We need to get the faith from the word of God that will fuel our hope and confidence in God so that we arise. And then when we arise, we must be prepared to go. We must be prepared to put feet to our prayers. We must be prepared to get moving and to become witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many I see in our land beginning to do it. 
There are many beginning to get the vision. Many are beginning, beginning to get the understanding that God is not finished with this land. Standing in Belfast yesterday afternoon, there must have been 15 or 20 Christians. Some of them spoke for the first time. It will not be the last time. That's all I know in my spirit. There are many young people rising up and they're seeing the light. And they're seeing that God is real. And they're getting set free from drug addictions and alcohol addictions and sins that they couldn't even mention. They're getting free. And they're going after God. Holy violence. You know the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Isn't it amazing that God is not finished? Do you know it looks hopeless? It looks like it was in Jonah's time. So hopeless. So helpless a situation. But thank God. When the God of heaven. When the God of Israel. When the God who sent the angels. When the God who sent the prophets. When the God who sent his lovely son. The Lord Jesus Christ. When he's involved friends. There's always hope. He said arise. He said go. And he said preach. God has a good track record. It's not just Jonah that has been saved. You remember, friends, there's many stories in the Bible where the God of heaven, he brought light out of death. He brought light out of darkness. Yeah. I wonder if he's going to bring liberty out of a lockdown. Yeah. 